I know time is precious and we're right over the lunch hour. So I'm going to go ahead and kick us off as we see some more people um, logging in and joining. So good afternoon, everyone. You are attending Guiding Bright Minds Ask the Expert series, and it's Superpowers of Learning Disabilities, an asset-based approach. Um, I'm so excited about today's because anytime we can have um, somebody who is experiencing it firsthand and having a dynamic child to join us, um, is, is so exciting and so profound. So Abby, we are so excited to have you. Hi everyone, I am Tiffany Feingold, co-founder of Guiding Bright Minds. And before I introduce Abby and her mom, um, Dr. Durchie, I wanted to mention who I am and, and why I started um, Guiding Bright Minds about five years ago. Um, amazing parent of an amazing young boy. And all of a sudden we started noticing things getting a little chaotic when it was loud, overwhelming settings. He was getting kicked out of daycares and swim lessons. And anytime a lot of stimulation was happening, he had a hard time um, controlling his impulses, his emotions. And so we were working endlessly and tirelessly to figure out how do we help this boy? How do we find um, you know, the tools and the resource? What does this mean? What does this look like? And so through that process of trying to figure out why, what, how, when, what does this look like? I knew that I needed to build a community that brought parents, educators, and professionals together to help our amazing kids. And so that's why the ultimate goal is to help parents find and figure out how to connect with professionals who are dedicated um, to helping our, our amazing neurodiverse children to understand what that looks like, to understand that path. And so that is one of our biggest priorities is connecting you to amazing people like Dr. Durchie and what she does and her experience and journey, which led her into the practice of what she's doing. The second thing that we want to do through Guiding Bright Minds is to provide education. What is autism? What is dyslexia? What is ADHD? What's the difference between a medical evaluation and a diagnostic evaluation? And all of these differences that are out there, where are the different schools that my child should go to or consider, or how do we partner with a school? So we want to provide education. And then the other thing, and the biggest thing too, is to unite you with other families. Um, I know firsthand that meeting other parents who understood what I was going through made a profound impact on my growth and development. And so it's to unite you. So if you have not had an opportunity, I'll put it in the chat um, to where you can log in to Guiding Bright Minds. You can join us free as a member. We will hook you up with all of those tools and resources, strategies, guidance, share events with you, and just help you on your journey because um, I know what that's like. So I also want to hear from you. So if you have suggestions, advice, concerns, topics you want to hear about, please don't hesitate to reach out and let me know how I can help you and what we can do on this journey together. So thank you so much for your time and being a part of this. So let me introduce my two expert panelists with us today. Dr. Melissa Durchie is a mother, wife, teacher, and doctor of education. Her journey or her journey to her doctoral degree began when one of her twin daughters, Abigail, other known as Abby, was diagnosed with dyslexia before her first grade school year. Dr. Jerchi soon realized she wanted to create pathways for other families navigating the educational system. We know that that system can be quite a journey. So thank you, Melissa, very much for that. Melissa has 21 years of educational experience working with neurodiverse children from kindergarten through high school. Her experience in her doctoral program included focused work on giftedness, disabilities, twice exceptionality, racial inequities. She owns and is the director of Navigating Education. So welcome. And Abby is a spunky and creative 12 year old with a flair for computers and drawing. Her favorite art pieces right now are dragons. 
She's interested in graphic design and exploring the world of computer animation right now. Abby has a deep love for animals, specifically their family dog, Coda, a miniature golden doodle. Abby is a neurodiverse learner with a diverse learning profile. Part of her journey includes dyslexia, which she will tell you more about in her own words. So welcome. I will hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tiffany. We're really excited to be here. And um, Abigail is very excited to be out of school today so that she can be here with you guys and uh, share about, she has a passion for sharing about um, her experiences and things like that. So um, I'm going to share my screen and um, do a couple of housekeeping things. I'm going to present first, and then we're going to turn the time over to Abby. Actually, Abby, when she went through her practice yesterday, I actually adjusted mine to bring mine down a little bit, meaning just not as much time for me because she had so much powerful stuff that she was sharing. And I was like, yes, that would totally be something that would have helped us when we were back at the very beginning of Abigail's journey. We're right in the middle of it. So um, I'm going to share my screen and make sure that we can see. All right, Tiffany, just let me know if you aren't able to see that. Um, like Tiffany said, I'm Dr. Melissa Durchi with Navigating Education. And as the name says, we navigate everything educational based. So today we're going to be specifically talking about bringing that asset focus into and making disabilities as a superpower and how Abby's been able to do that. Um, so I want to start out with a, with a little bit about me um, in addition to what Tiffany said. And I specifically share a picture of my family because I want to frame us in this idea of, I call it Facebook scrolling, like as we're scrolling through Facebook and we see these beautiful pictures of family or things that people are doing. We don't see the before and after, right? We don't see the bribing with candy to get them to smile, to take the picture. And uh, so this picture represents a moment in time for my family, but you don't see the before and the after of the meltdowns and the crying and the th things like that. It was so cold. <laughs> it was so cold that day. Um, and so I want to frame it in that way because as we talk today, it's very easy to go, oh my gosh, they have so many things in place. I need you to understand it's been six years of a journey um, for our family and what does it mean for our family? And so take it as a snapshot in time. And yes, we have some things that she's going to share today that are in place for her that work. And it gives you a view for if you have a young kiddo with that has a neuro difference, you can see somebody who's in that middle school age group who has had exposure to this and talking about it and openly discussing it over time. So I just want to frame it in that way. Um, also, as we go through today, Abby's going to be presenting and myself, and then we're going to have a question and answer session. We have Tiffany that can help moderate those questions. We also have our case manager here at Navigating Education. Her name is Sam. She will also be um, looking through the chat and asking questions along the way. So if you have questions as we go, please put them in the chat um, and Tiffany and or Sam will bring them up as we go, or they might save them till the question and answer session. All right. So, um, like Tiffany said, one of the reasons that we are doing this is because, meaning we as in navigating education and my own family, is because of our Abby. And um, these were all things for Abigail that are all describing her. And now she's even more incredible with her um, computer animated animations and things like that. One thing that came up um, at the end of kindergarten was this dyslexia. And it started to overshadow some of these things that we know about our Abby. And not only did that, but then it started to overshadow Abigail. And so we had to figure some things out. And it caused a lot of stress, not only for Abigail in learning, but then also our family trying to help with homework. How much do we step in and help? How much do we hold back? And um, so it led me on my journey to do- Melissa, Abby. I think you froze. Oh no. Did I freeze? You're not, we're not frozen on Sam's side. Mm -hmm. So Tiffany, um, Sam says that we're not frozen on your, her side. Let's see. The chat is saying it's not frozen. Okay. It's not frozen. So we're going to keep going. Uh, Tiffany, I think it might be on your side. Sam's telling me that it's okay. So 
what? Tiffany's frozen. Tiffany's frozen. Okay. So Tiffany, hopefully um, you can hop back online. It says participants can now see my screen. So I'm going to keep going. Sam's telling me that she can see everything. So we're going to keep going. So navigating education, the idea here is what if I can't, or how do we reframe it for families and for kids being able to um, navigate through the system? So whoop. the things that we test for, these are just some of them where we do educational evaluations and things like that. Today, what I want to especially focus on is how I describe neurodifference as superpowers to kids and how I frame that for children. Um, people are always asking me that. How do I talk to my child about this? Do I give them the label? What if they um, don't... It, is it beneficial to have the label or do we hold that back and, until they can understand it? So I'm going to talk about how I describe a neural difference and then creating a PowerPoint um, from Yes Colorado. I want to make sure to give them a shout out. Uh, they, they are an amazing group of young people who um, advocate for uh, specifically for dyslexia and changed my life and therefore changed my daughter's life. So she's gonna share her PowerPoint that was inspired from Yes Colorado. And then she's gonna do her presentation and then we'll have questions and answers at the end. So that's kind of framing our time together today. Um, so how do I talk to kids about a neuro difference? I say, have you ever heard of Superman? And they're like, yes. <laughs> and so I say that every great hero like Superman has a weakness. I said, do you know what Superman's weakness is? And they'll kind of think for a second and they're like, oh, it's that green stuff. And I'm like, yep, it's called kryptonite. Every great hero has some weakness. And so even though Superman is the super strong, powerful um, superhero, he has kryptonite that can get in his way sometimes. So he has to make sure to avoid the kryptonite. Every great athlete, we just had the um, Winter Olympics, every great athlete has a coach. So behind every athlete, you're going to see a coach that is helping them along in the process. So not only do superheroes have weaknesses, athletes have coaches. Um, we also have a support system around our kiddos that have neurodifference. And so we can be that support system for, and I talk with the kids about you are, every person on the planet has a, a superpower of some kind and something that's hard for them. Yours might be related to school and that's okay. Um, you also have things that are amazing because when our brains take up so much energy, in uh, one area, it might allow us to do things in another area. And so Abigail's going to share some of the things that her brain is able to do because of her neural difference. Um, so I give, like I said, I want to give a shout out to Yes Colorado. This is a great resource for anyone. Um, even if you're not in Colorado, they do a lot of stuff online. Um, and it's these students are talking about kind of like Abby's going to do today. They go around to different conferences and such. So the Yes Colorado Ambassadors, um, it's Youth Examples of Self-Advocacy. And I was like, yes, you're speaking my language because self-advocacy is something that we talk a lot about in education and we want our kids to be able to say what they need and be able to express to their teachers, but sometimes they're not able to because maybe their verbal skills are not super advanced and it makes them very nervous. Maybe they're super shy. They gave a great example of this PowerPoint idea. And so um, that's what Abby's gonna do today. So here is um, the outline for the PowerPoint that Yes Colorado, when they did their presentation, some introduction, a focus on your favorites, that I'm this person and I do all these things, lots of pictures to describe who they are. We haven't even said, what the disability is yet. We wanna focus on those assets for the person and then name the disability and that's okay. That's okay to give it a name because then it doesn't feel like it's, um, that anything is wrong with that person. And then how does it affect you? And also how can teachers help? Those are the things that have been really powerful for Abigail um, to be able to share with her teachers. All right, so now, um, and for, for the throwback to um, Indiana Jones, you sometimes just have to jump in with it and give something a try. Like some of the accommodations that we'll talk about today, you might just have to try. And just because it works for Abby may or may not work for your child, but you gotta kind of jump in. And so um, in this scene 
in the Temple of Doom, um, Indiana Jones is looking out and he sees this vast chasm and he he's like, I have to get to the other side and I can't see the path. And the clue says that he has to either, that he has to step into it, into growth. And so he kind of closes his eyes and he steps forward. And it's not until he steps forward onto it that he sees the path to be able to get through to the other side. So I would just encourage you as a family to step out into that unknown territory and try things out because that's when you're going to start to see the pathway and to let go of expectation of how things should be. All right. So now I'm going to turn this time over to Abby. We're actually going to switch places. And I'm going to do way less talking and Miss Abby is going to share her uh, presentation for you. Hello, everyone. And my name is Abby. And here is a little bit about me. Also, a little bit on what you said earlier. Yes, I do like to draw dragons, but my main focuses are cats and dogs, since those are what I'm most good at. Things I like and also love. First of all, my dog, Coda. He is in the picture right there. He's a very good boy and will jump all over you, giving you kisses, and will just, this tail, if he, if his tail wagged anymore, he would be a helicopter. Next, being able to draw. It's how I, being able to draw what I feel like. For example, like if I wanted, when I was in a really bad mood, I could draw something to represent that bad mood. And it just kind of puts it, it just like, goodbye, bleh. <laughs> And third of all, I love talking about my dyslexia who, and since I know how to help kids with a similar disorder, although I don't like to call it that, I like to call it a superpower because, well, that's what it is. Finally, I love to share my random thoughts because it's one of the ways that I show I trust you. Also, one I didn't put on here is doing like a talk game. It's basically creating your own story. I usually do it with my sister. Here are some of my drawings. The fox with the orb over its head is a kitsune, and I drew it for my sister since she loves kitsunes. The drawing on the bottom is a different kind of style I was trying from a YouTuber called Cheetahs. It's one of her, it's her style. And the and the last one is one of my OCs for my sister, me and my sister's game. It's kind of a like a galaxy wolf. Here is the first prototype of my wolf mask for a project that we were doing during school. And well, it became this. And I'm very happy with how it's coming along. And we're still furring it right now, though. Here is the second one. This is the one we used. And as you can see, that little boy over there <laughs> looking very bored is my brother, Ryan. He is a very sweet boy. And he's taught me a lot about like Minecraft. He's like a god. He's, he's amazing at gaming. This, this I, like, I like drawing and reading and I have dyslexia. I know what you're thinking, Abby. How could you like reading if you have dyslexia? Well, I've had a tutor for five years and to help me with in my reading and writing, I'm still struggling with the writing part. And I drew this picture right here for my mom. You can name the pups if you want, but the black one is always lunar. Nothing's gonna change that. I have dyslexia and sometimes it can be hard for me. I really struggle in math because it's very stressful for me. That's why I have a calculator because I can literally not do anything because I'm so stressed. If I do not have it, I get over so overwhelmed that it's like brain go stop. Like, and I can't do anything. It's so uh, ca having a calculator really does help me. I struggle with writing because I'm not quick at writing and I know now from sixth grade that I'm get, I do a lot of writing 
Yes. And I pro and I've noticed that there's a lot of writing and the teacher's gonna wipe away the board before I'm done writing. I've noticed that a lot. So something I've seen that helps me a lot is voice to text because I have such good ideas with writing it and I just can't get them down on paper because the paper or or I can't type them because my fingers won't work. In fact, I'm using it right now in this entire, in this thing. My reading skills still affect me though. It takes me a little bit longer in order to understand things like science, social studies, but if it's a book of my choice, I can understand it like that insert snap. I cannot snap at all. <laughs> So sometimes I need a little bit more time, and if you can provide that for me, we, and if people can, and if my teachers can provide that for me, we are best friends, and they have been able to provide that for me, and I'm really happy with it. Here's how they can help. One of the main things that you can do to help me is give me more time, although I may not look like I need it. I still need it, like, if I'm copying down notes in class and cannot copy so fast, I need more time in order to do that. So if you can provide that, that would be wonderful, and they have been able to provide it. I struggle with math because it's very stressful. Even if it's, like, two plus two, I freak out and become very stressed and stiff. I don't know what that word is. <laughs> That's okay. That's why I use a calculator. If you give, if they give, they give me the privilege to use a calculator, it'd be very good for me. And, and it would make my scores higher. Even it's, if you think the calculator is not good for me, I, I still need it or else I freeze up and not, and be, and I am not able to do learning because of how stressed I am. This is my, this way my brain can focus on understanding and actually get the problem done. Uh, a bit on the subject of the calculator, I actually had someone in my class, I'm not saying names because that would be rude, and they asked, why do you have a calculator? That's so unfair. And I said, it's, and the kids at my table know that it's part of my 504 and they said, and I'm very happy with this, it's in her 504 and they say, it's, and they say, it's still not fair. And I said, I can pull it out and I do, and I put, and I point to it and say, here, this is where it is. And they say, it's still not fair. <laughs> I do not. At least I showed it to them. At least I have proof. It's very helpful to have proof if like, oh, hey, teacher, I need that you forgot that I have this accommodation with my thing and so can I use it? And also being a dyslexic also means I also means in my personal experiences with dyslexia, I cannot spell well, which means I might need a word bank. For example, it would be wonderful if I had an important word I should use in paragraphs. I have a, sp I have a spell checker, which aka spelly, spelling ace, holy crap, I cannot talk, okay. for, for it because I cannot spell very well. At, like. I really work very hard on my spelling and I've been, go like I said before, I've been going for five years and I'm speaking of which I'm about to graduate. So yeah. here's how teachers can help me. Sometimes I need, sometimes I need help organizing things in my binder where it's supposed to be. So we're going to we're going to keep going there. When she mentioned the organization yesterday as we were practicing, we decided to bring, um, let's see if we can make it so we can see ourselves. There we go. Okay, so um, because I thought that this might be really helpful for families to see, this was actually something that the school does. It's, it's um, called a, a case it. Yeah, it's case it is the organizer in our day, my day, it would have been a trapper keeper. <laughs> but the company is called case it. 
And what we did is her headphones, um, because Abby has some sensory stuff, she wears them on the outside. So we added a little pouch that she puts her headphones in on the outside so that um, she doesn't have to fit her earbuds or things like that in inside the case. She yeah. just has them on the outside. So this would fit any standard um, headphone set. So she just carries it around with it and we just put it on with um, hooks. So we're going to show you inside because this has transformed her ability to uh, her, exe yeah, her executive that. functioning stuff. So she's going to walk you through it. So this is mesh because kids like me need like to be able to see it because if it if we can't see it, it doesn't exist. And that's actually a very common thing with dyslexics is um, if you put it in a drawer and the drawer goes away, literally they it doesn't, it, it, exist. it doesn't exist in their mind. So having mesh really helps because they can see their supplies right there. Um, her calculator that she uses in math. It's uh, like a dollar store calculator. It's not, it's really cheap. You get it like at the Dollar Tree or Dollar Store. It, we don't need like really expensive calculators because one time, and I'm still very mad about <laughs> I accidentally left one of these calculators over winter break and and it got beaten up like to a pulp. It didn't work anymore. The screen was shattered. It was like covered in a green And so we buy goo. them in groups of five. So I just have them at the house when um, it breaks. It's no big deal because it's a buck and I can just go to my stash that she doesn't know about and I can pull them out and give them to her so that she can have it um, in school. One thing to help a lot with executive functioning is to make sure that there's a standard time each week. We do it on Tuesdays and Thursdays that we go through her binder, um, that I'm her coach during that time. It's not me doing it all and me taking everything out because as a as a sixth grader and a middle schooler, she's got to start to develop those skills, but she needs a coach. She needs to learn how to do it. Do you want to talk about the rest of it? Uh, sure. Uh, here is like where I keep all my markers and stuff. Here's my planner. Me and mom have to fill it out because uh, I don't, I'm not very good at it. We're still in training process for that. Yeah. <laughs> here's my social study slash history stuff. And here is my science stuff. Here is the navigating education thing. It is very special because one, it mom went to five different like people who have dyslexia dyscalculia all that stuff and color-coded it from five different dyslexics and it has this because sometimes you need help sometimes kids like me are feeling like really down and we need like a reinforcer so when we're having really much trouble she makes me read one of these out loud and it works. It works really well. So the color coding on the front, this is a standard multiplication chart. And what I did is I talked with dyslexics that experienced it and I said, what would you want in a multiplication chart? Um, because math facts are a traditional thing that um, people struggle with. Uh, sometimes with dyslexia, it can be dyscalculia, but it doesn't have to be. And they said, we need to be able to track it. So that's why they're that way. And then um, the busyness, and I know it feels busy for me as a sequential thinker. I'm like, that's, that feels busy. But every time I put it in front of a dyslexic, they're like, oh yeah, I can totally track the purple and they can track it really easily. And if I prompt them that they're, it's in the greens, then they can go and track that. So that's, she has it right in here so that she can use it during math class. And here is some lined paper in this folder. We use, me and mom use it to organize our things so it's not just a jumbled mess. So she can actually read what I'm doing. So you're going to notice that this is um, graph paper. You can just buy it wherever you buy your lined, regular lined paper. And I put it in here so that she can use it. Um, many times they have spatial issues when they're trying to line things up like um, addition, multiplication, division, stuff like that. And the graph paper gives them a concrete area to write their number and it helps them to line up the um, place values. Yep, so that's super helpful. Here is my math thing. And this is just like a binder. This is just like a folder that I do like my math work in. Here is my 504. It's in the very back so it doesn't get ruined. And I haven't really had to use it much, but there, 
like that I told way, you. Um, I work with a lot of clients that, you know, they, they mentioned that um, I wasn't able to get my accommodation for testing or whatever. If it's directly in and you, and the student has access to it all the time, they can refer back to it and like, um, encourage uh, their teacher in the moment they can refer to it right here. Like, Hey, uh, I need this. Like, yeah. yeah. The other thing that I wanted to show is this, this. part that is truly like, Oh, it's the awesome spot. Um, prior to so fifth grade, she, we homeschooled, but fourth grade, um, we really struggled with getting stuff home and back to school. It, and we just had like, like, bunch of dead papers <laughs> on the bottom of the backpack that was our family that was our family it was I, horrible <laughs> literally one time I had to take out a iron because it was something that had to get turned in and we couldn't even write on it because it was so crumpled and so I took like a something and laid a towel down and like ironed it out so we could at least write on it and um so I mean good look times, at how nice times. these papers are I mean this is huge and anyone that has a neurodiverse kiddo it doesn't have to be dyslexia like this is amazing and it's been really really helpful can you repeat the name of the yes the name of it is case it c-a-s-e dash i-t case it um, and there's tons of different colors and things like that you can buy them on amazon um i bought one of them on Amazon and one of them on another one just because of the colors. But uh, each color has um, different things. Yeah. So, so she knows back, exactly where all of her math is. It's all right. It's here. always in the back. The My personal stuff is always in the front. My LA stuff is second. Third is social studies and fourth is math. And then, you know, not math, yeah. science. And then here is math. And then back here is like I don't know what the back here is for because we don't have like five periods. Yeah. Before. So it's it's been really helpful for her to be able to find her stuff. And this is especially what we go through each uh, twice a week, just cleaning them out and like, okay, now I want you. And again, I don't do it for her. Um, at the beginning, it was more my, like I would hold them and just, we would talk about them. Now she holds them and I'm prompting her with things like, okay, so which are the things that you've already turned in? And then we have, she would get stressed out because she's like, well, what if I end up needing it this semester? So we actually made a little folder that just sits here in my office because we come and do homework here. But you could have a folder at your house and you just, whatever they don't use, you can just put into that folder. That way you, that she can stop worrying about it. And she knows that if she needed it, we could go find it in that folder. Like, for example, I forgot to do one of my syllabus scavenger hunts for science and I was freaking out about it, but then I found it in here. Mm -hmm. um, and this, you could probably totally relate to this. Um, neurodiverse kids can really struggle with um, getting their supplies out. And sometimes they spend over half the time, a lot of time to work on their assignment. Instead, they spend it trying to, uh, trying find, to find all their stuff. Like, <laughs> so where's my pencil? Where's my calculator? Where's the assignment? Yeah. And like I said earlier, this is going to work for some kids and it's not going to work for everybody. It's not a fix all. Um, one other thing that I wanted to point out is here in her front pouch right here. Um, there are a couple, so laminated, like her schedule, her class schedule, um, important people. If she needed to talk with, um, the counselor at her school, it's going to be right there. She, if she went to the office and she's like, and she's overwhelmed, then, um, she could say, I, I just need to, and she can point to it. She needs to talk to that person. Um, but it gives her a predictability of her schedule. And then this one is um, one that we made off the cuff. They were reading a book together as a class called Touching Spirit Bear. Yeah. And so I went in and um, downloaded the book so that she could have access um, and worked with her teacher. Her teacher, shout out to their team because her teacher was phenomenal with this. But I want Abby to be able to access it on her own without the teacher having to do it every day. So I made Abby a card with the steps on how to access her um, Spirit Bear book. And so then she can have her headphones on. Everybody's reading the book, but she, if she's reading it at school, she can have access to the audio book. And so if she forgets or, and I let the teacher know that it was right here in the, her front pouch, that um, she can be responsible to log in. So...
that's a case set that we wanted to share with you. And it is very Any other useful. questions that came up for that one? Okay. Okay. All right, so we're gonna share back our screen and she had one more to share on there and then we'll go to questions. So make sure you're putting your questions in there if you have them. There we go. Okay. And then you can go on to number six. Yep. Set a writing assignment that I will need to use voice to text a lot more than I can write. Wait, what? I need to use voice to text so I can get my ideas down instead of like just awkward silence of me just like trying to think of what, how to spell the word. Like I have horrible spelling. I could, I can spell simple words, but I cannot spell like super califragilistic. <laughs> I cannot spell that. I cannot say it. And so voice to text really does help because I can talk a lot more than I can write. Like, for example, here, mm -hmm. I'm talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and um, what we found to work, at least here in the United States, within Colorado, because this is going to be different um, depending on where you're at, a lot of the schools here in Colorado use uh, Google Docs. And within Google Docs, there is um, under the tools button, there is an, a speaker or a mic that you can click. So anywhere that she's at, if she's logged into her um, account when she's doing it, well, anytime she's logged into any of the, the Google apps, if she's logged into the Google uh, Docs tools, microphone, then she can automatically do it. So it's something easy in the classroom because it's what all of the students use. It's not something different that she's using compared to other students. Um, and it's a just, lot of times people ask, how hard is it to adapt to that? Like, is it hard to no. use the, the voice to text? No, it's not really all that hard. It's not hard at all. You just have to go in and correct the errors that the voice to text does because, holy crap, it yeah, sometimes it, yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, one other thing to help with that also is a Chrome extension is uh, Grammarly. So Grammarly will underline misspelled words, but then it will also in another color underline grammatical errors. And so it can be on anything, an, uh, an email that you're typing. Um, I have it on my computer on Chrome and it's just a Chrome extension. Again, that is um, Grammarly. And it's a really helpful tool. Yeah. So we've finished up some of the things that we wanted to talk about. And um, I have some set questions to ask Abby, but if there are questions that you have for either of us, um, we're now to the question and answer portion of things. Um, so we're going to see if Tiffany or Sam have uh, any questions that have come up in the chat. So Thank ask that away. Was, uh, that was wonderful, Abby. Thank you guys so much. I think, you know, it's so profound, again, to hear, you know, your experience and what you're going through and what that means to you and the tools and resources to help you guys, and especially as, you know, parents. So, so tell me about the collaboration um, of, of how you guys work collectively together, because I know sometimes it definitely can be a battle or a struggle between parents and children and, and that piece of it when parents have good intentions in mind, but it, it may not come across. So how have you overcome some of those obstacles? Um, it's like, okay, so um, me and mom are doing an immensely hard math problem and I am getting really stressed. And mom helps me by like, talking to me calmly, first of all, because that is a huge portion of it, because you need to be calm when you're speaking to your kid, and, like, if you're not being calm towards your kid, your kid's gonna freak out. It's <laughs> like, if you're not calm, I'm not calm! Ah! So what helps you with um, working through it? Like, you pointing out things that could help me, or like giving me like a lead, like I can do it once I know what I'm doing, like take a different problem that is related to this problem and work through that one so I understand, then do it. It's like, so there was this really complicated math problem. I already said that. 
Let me uh, share something about from a parent perspective, um, working with Abby, she also has sensory processing um, things. And so for her, a lot of times the, the meditative type of things, like, and so I'll have to have her look at me and I'm like, just breathe and reassuring her that I'm on her team, that, that yes, it's hard right now. Um, validating the feeling and emotion in that moment is really important. Um, saying, let's just get this done or, um, uh, just get over it type of thing. They literally can't get through it because they are so blocked at that point. So Abby, I can see that you're stressed right now. I understand that you're stressed and I, I can relate to that, you know, relating, validating, and then saying, one of the things that helps me is taking a deep breath. I just want you to breathe with me. And even if they're not breathing, even if you do the exaggerated breaths to try and calm it, they will um, feed off of that, even if they're not the one doing it and just doing that again and again. Sometimes um, it's called bilateral simulation, but like walking, it's anytime you get both sides of your body moving, um, laughing, things like that. Um, one thing is you can, it depends on your kiddo though. If they don't like sensory stuff, this isn't going to work, but like you can hold their hand and just go back and forth and a pressure so that they can just, because they just need their brain to start moving again. So it needs to take it off of where they are. I think that's important for parents to realize, you know, and there's might be a lot of things like you're trying to cook dinner and they're doing homework and all these things are happening. But in that moment of time, when a child gets stuck and they get blocked, um, they have to be able to move past. It's not as easy as, as just kind of get over it. And, you know, I love that piece, um, the standard multiplication chart that you had. Is that something that we can send out? Because having the motivational talk on the back is, is so profound. And, and that's the thing that, you know, everyone needs that. And I think that's the thing. It doesn't matter if there's a specific diagnosis that goes along with it. My son, for example, Abby, who's in second grade, and I have to Google some of his math. Um, and he's like, oh, mommy, I thought you had a college degree. I'm like, I have a math weakness. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, thank you for highlighting that. But you're right. I can't do your second grade math because that's not my strength. And I don't want to want to pretend. So it was helpful to him to see we all learn differently. Every single person, some might have a title to it. Some may not, but that's the key is that everyone has that uniqueness. In fact, you know, my son's school, they were doing something about Michael Jordan where his thing is like, he, he had, you know, 9,000 rebounds and missed these many shots and this thing but yet he's one of the greatest basketball players because he failed in order to succeed. And I love that piece. So I'd love to share that. And I do see a question coming in. Um, let's see. Thank you both for sharing your experiences. My daughter's also very stressed about math. Did you guys put, get pushed back from the school or the teachers about including a calculator in your 504 plan? Great question. Um, so actually we had to leave one of the school, a school near us that me and my sister and my brothers could walk to, like we had to leave it because they were not accommodating to my 504 because I was doing so well. Um, so we had to move schools. So yeah, and that's a reality sometimes. So the current school that they're at, no. Um, but also beginning in fourth grade, Abby started attending her 504s, um, her annual ones, and she presented her presentation with how you can help me. It was really difficult to turn down the child saying, I need this, I need a calculator, and me being able to show here's her data for the math fact fluency, um, that it's giving her an a uh, playing field that's similar to other kids. It's not giving her an advantage. Um, so having the student to be able to explain that that's what they need. Um, I do that all the time with families and it completely depends. So I attend IEP meetings with families and there's mixed reviews about it, right? But when I'm there with the family, then we can explain about the data. You have to have the data to show that their fluency, um, for some reason, they're, when they're under pressure for timing, that it's uh, difficult, but uh, there's there's mixed reviews back from the school. But if you can show the data that has 
fluency. And I encourage to have, if you have a secondary student, meaning um, in the United States, that would be like sixth grade and above, uh, start having them come and explaining what they need. It's a lot harder to turn down the student themselves than it is to say to the parents, no, they'll be okay. Um, we just let all the kids, you know, whatever. So yes and no. <laughs> um, have I had pushback? Yes. Um, gently encouraging them back to the data um, is, a, is a great way to go. And, and I think to your point is, is figuring out how to have the student, depending on age, advocate for themselves to be able to articulate, which is hard. Um, I think that's where a lot of parents is, you know, especially if you're in the beginning of your journey, you're like, I'm not even sure what to ask for. Like, at what point did you know that Abby needed a calculator? How do you dissect what that is and what that looks like? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great point. Um, how I knew from a parent's point of view are the tears. Um, when we would practice math facts all the time. I tear up. It was horrible. It was not fun. Nothing was good. Math was horrible. I hated it. It was not fun. <laughs> Everything was horrible when I did math. Holy crap. <laughs> and so we would do the par the teachers would say, well, let's just try the online. Like there were different types of online programs that you can do and it would come up yellow and red. And so we would try it at home. We would try everything to get them those math facts done. And having been an educator myself, like we would, we would try all the strategies and it would, it ended up in tears. And so night after night after night of having tears and emotional breakdowns on both sides, it just wasn't worth it anymore. I'm like, if it can just be a calculator, this is not something that she's going to overcome right now. And if she can have the calculator beside her and do the math problem, instead of all of her time trying to do six times five and doing all the strategies to figure that out, she can do the multi-step problem because she's pulling apart a multi-step problem, reading it. And she's trying to do the strategies for the six times five. And it's like brain overwhelm. And it's like yeah. shut down, yeah. shut down. And it's like, it's the flight or flight, flight or freeze. For me, when I'm doing math, it sets off that freeze for me. And I'm like, Ugh! and I can't do anything. I can, it's like. My brain will just completely shut down and it is just tears, overwhelming. And it's like, <laughs> no, so I, there you go. That's how we knew. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And, and I know, you know, we might have some educators on as well who are attending, you know, from an educator standpoint too, in this question, if you guys could do in the chat, you know, what, how, how can parents and the student what are you looking for as well? If we do have any on the line that would like to just put in the chat, that again helps with the process and collaboration and having an open collaborative, you know, discussion um, is, is so profound because it's ultimately the child that's kind of, you know, in the center, in the middle, that's, that's experiencing and going through what they need to have that. So if anyone has any suggestions and would like to add, I'd love to hear viewpoints too and your perspective yeah. on this discussion. Me, while people are putting those in, I wanted to go back to the beginning of the presentation with the picture of my family. We have to remember that these types of moments per being able to present are surrounded by the chaos on either side, right? So kind of letting go. I know Tiffany, you and I had had that conversation before of just letting go as a parent of this isn't going to be perfect and it's going to be okay because it's not perfect. Nobody's <laughs> perfect and it's going to be okay. You can tell we've had those conversations, yes. right? I love and that because Abby, I told my son that I'm like, just pat me on the shoulder and remind me because as I'm folding laundry, cooking dishes, helping with homework or running around and he's like, it's okay, mommy, if we're late. It's like, like just to have us working together to say, it'll all work out. I love that. And to let go. I'm never going to have an, an evening where it's just a blissful making of, of dinner. And I don't know if I'd want that. I mean, like, let's face reality of what this is. And, yeah. and, and it eases so much additional struggles and frustrations and tears and stuff that don't need to be there. Um, 
when we all work together. And I love Abby, how you said to your mom, she says it calm. Um, cause it's not all the time. I, I have to say, it's, it's, hard. Hard. it's not all the time, friends. <laughs> like I'll be real about it. It's not because I mean, uh, parenting it's neuro, neuro different children is exhausting. And so from a parent to other parents, and even as a doctor of education, like, you know, people are like, oh, well, you've got it so easy or, oh, you know, all this right. I'm like, but I'm still a mom. Like, and it's still, you know, building this relationship is, it still takes the time it and you're exhausted effort. and you're laying in bed and like tears and everything. So, um, just give yourself grace and, um, a moment to breathe yourself as a parent, that it is very difficult, um, try, that you want what's best for your child and you want them to have the best possibilities in the future. And I think for me, um, when we first had her tested and I, it was life altering for me because I was like, I don't know what that future, I can't envision her future yet. And now with the things that she's doing and the beautiful drawings that she does something I could never do. And it's like, I get these little glimpses of what her future could be and all the possibilities that there are. And I'm like, okay, I needed to be told that back then that it's going to be okay. And that it's going to be an even cooler future than you could have even have dreamed up if you kind of let go with it and go with their direction of things that they're interested in and uh, nurturing those um, gifts. A bit go on ahead. what you said. How do you cook dishes? How do you cook? Did I say cook dishes? Yes. How do you cook <laughs> dishes? <laughs> That's a great question. Oh my gosh, does my son would have caught that too. And I would be like, just blabbering. He's like, well, what you said just didn't make sense. I'm like, what do you mean? That is funny. Cooking food in my dishes and doing dishes, <laughs> hopefully not while I'm cooking. Oh, uh, we've had some great comments, people. Thank you. You know, um, let's see, what did somebody say? Um, these are exactly the same challenges my daughter is having. So this is helpful. Thank you. Um, the Dyslexic Advantage is a fabulous book. Highly recommend it. Um, love that. Um, any other questions? We haven't seen a lot of questions. I know, Melissa, you mentioned you had some that you had prepared as well. We're getting yeah. up to the hour. Um, but if you, anyone if you else? like some of the questions, um, a lot of questions that or Did you have one that you wanted to share? Uh, actually, it's more of a statement on what that person said on the recommended book. I also have a book to recommend, which is kind of like me like explaining this to you it's called fish in a tree it's like like a kid about my age explaining what it is for them and it's different for all different kids like it could be like reading and math for one person or drawing not draw and it could be writing and literature it could be anything for different kids like yeah, it's... yeah. The book, the book that she mentioned is "Fish in a Tree," and it's a, a narrative book and it's a story. Um, and we read it what third grade, fourth grade. Yeah, and I'm... and we did it. It's like a read aloud together, and we read it aloud together. Um, and it's the coming of understanding that she has a learning disability, and that's okay. Yeah, and because she, there's a lot of behavior things that come up and kids make fun of her and things like that. And then it comes out that there's this really caring teacher um, that helps her understand what her neuro difference is. It's really powerful. And uh, the idea of fish in a tree is an analogy of if we asked a child or a fish to climb a tree, and that's how we were evaluating them to be a good animal. The idea is a fish will never be able to climb a tree like a bear or a monkey, but they're all in that same class, right? The animal class. But if we were allowed, if the, the fish was allowed to demonstrate its ability in the ocean or in a pond or in a river, yeah, of being a great animal, then all of a sudden, look, they're a great animal, right? So the same idea is then parallel to schools. If we test in a certain way, if we do spelling tests, it's not that spelling tests are bad, but if that's the only way that we're evaluating um, abilities, and then we're going to miss some kids and their ability to be able to share their, their ideas and thinking. Yes. And we do have a question and, and thank you for sharing that. Um, 
how can we help our kids as far as second language learning is concerned? And that's an excellent question. That is a very good question. Are we speaking specifically about dyslexia? Well, first of all, it would need to be, um, so part of my education background is in cultural and linguistic diverse. I would encourage, first of all, um, to continue using the second language that's the native language in the home. I've heard families that they've been encouraged not to. I encourage it by all means, because the more that what you're developing in those early years is the love of literature, the love of talking, the love of culture, those types of things. And that can be done in either language. Um, Any language, it yeah. works. It's like, Reading. I'm fluent in English, so... Yeah. yeah. And like sitting down with your child and reading, um, let's say that the family knows Spanish and English. Sitting down and reading in Spanish is very valuable um, because it's learning to love because sitting on your parents' lap, talking about the book, looking at the pictures, laughing about the book, all of that develops that love of language and love of reading. Specifically to um, how to develop the dyslexic things, I would recommend an Orton-Gillingham approach, which is a hands-on approach, um, but don't discount either language. It's going to take them longer to develop it, but once they have both of them, it's going to be really solid, and they're going to be um, almost in an advantage later on. It does take longer to develop in both languages, but Orton-Gillingham approach is a hands-on approach for approach. So there's going to be different curriculums. Ones that are popular here in Colorado are Barton, um, oh, let's see, Barton, Wilson, Take Flight, any of those. So Barton, Wilson, Take Flight are curriculums underneath the umbrella of Orton-Gillingham. So what I would encourage is if they're doing a dual language, encourage that language, that rich language in the native language at home. And then if they're learning as a second language, possibly English or the other way around, but whatever it is that native at home, use that. Then um, if they need extra supports for learning uh, sounds, diagraphs, things like that in the English language, Orton-Gillingham approach is a great approach to use. Wonderful, thank you. I don't see any other questions. Um, I know we're getting to the top of the hour. I love, you know, the conversation and, and changing the dialogue that these are our superpowers. And when you look at every successful CEO, actors, they, all of those people, I mean, Sir Richard Ranch, Branson, not that I'm saying to drop out, but I mean, he struggled so bad. He dropped out at 16 because he told he was never going to succeed. And he's the first billionaire with eight billionaire corporations. It's, it's, it's unfortunate that our kids struggle so much and have to be in this, all the out of box learners in this system that, that holds them into this box when we need to be spreading our wings because once our amazing children get out into the world and shine and the superpowers and what they bring, this is where all those, you know, Justin Timberlake, Michael Phelps, you know, Richard Branson, Karen Knightley, Tom Hilfiger, um, Charles Schwab, Steven Spiel, I mean, the list goes on. Like I have this list to show and to remind us. I mean, our greatest leader is Albert Einstein. I mean, what would we do without him? Was all neurodiverse who've made an impact on this world. So the, let the super power shine through and, and just know that, you know, great things are to come. So I just appreciate you guys so much and your time. Um, and yes, yeah, somebody asked about the math facts multiplication sheet. Yes. So I'm going to send a copy of the recording of this um, presentation, a copy of the presentation, and we'll send a copy of the math facts as well to send out to everyone. So Abby, Melissa, thank you guys so much. It was such a pleasure meeting you. I loved this. I hope this was enjoyable for you as well. It Absolutely. Was. Thank it, you. Also, a little bit of thing uh, that I wanted to say from a quote from uh, Touching Spirit Bear, actions speak louder than words. Like if the student says that, like the teacher says that you cannot do this, but the student proves them wrong, that is the action speaking louder than words. Uh, yes. Yeah.
Yes. Well, thank you, Tiffany. We really appreciate Guiding Bright Minds and all that you do to help and support uh, neurodiverse children. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All and right. Thank you guys. Yeah. Thank yes. you. Thanks for spending your afternoon with us. All right. Bye, everyone. Thank you guys Bye. for attending. Bye.